everyone, a very good evening. You're watching The Money Show on ET Now. I'm Ubina Kapasi. It's Friday, so for all our regular viewers of The Money Show, that's right, it's our special segment of Ladies Club, Women's Club. Uh, and yes, I'm going to be hosting a very, very prestigious panel of only women. The theme today, teachers. Well, obviously, because it's the eve of Teachers Day. So let me take this uh, opportunity uh, to wish all the teachers, ex, present and future, a very happy Teachers Day. And thank you for your immeasurable contribution in shaping all of our lives and society uh, in general. Uh, this on behalf of me and the entire team of The Money Show. Well, uh, this has been quite a year for teachers, right? Uh, you had to deal with a sudden shift from not seeing your students in the classrooms to seeing them through little boxes, through a little tablet, um, not being able to catch any of them yapping or, you know, sneakily snacking under their desks. I know I was guilty of doing that. So let me also take this opportunity to say sorry to all my teachers for troubling them. But, you know, it's not just this transition to online education. It's also the kind of gumption this entire situation demands of you teachers uh, to conduct tests, to conduct examinations. We have the new national education policy as well that will, I'm sure, require teachers to go back to the drawing boards. And of course, this ever changing world that COVID-19 has thrown us in. So many businesses, so many jobs disrupted. So the idea behind today's show is not just to get a sense of how and where is education heading, but also perhaps to give some guidance to uh, all the prospective teachers, all the future teachers out there uh, that while, yes, there is this temporary disruption where you have to shun the blackboard for the tablet, but the more fundamental change perhaps, um, you know, in the methods of teaching, uh, which will involve training students to be relevant uh, in an era where where, you know, the cycle of disruption to jobs and businesses is getting shorter and shorter. So like I said, I have with me a very distinguished panel of women who boast many, many glorious years of experience in education, uh, who have not just been through these changes in teaching methodologies, but brought them about in the way students should be educated and that you across different age groups. So let's introduce each one of them in the order of the age group that they specialize in. First up, uh, I have with me Shubda Dayal. She's the founder of Brainology, which is um, you know, a firm that tries to develop critical thinking and problem solving skills in young children. In fact, uh, it also provides a step-by-step self-learning program focused on five to 10 year olds. Uh, Shubda, thank you for joining us today on the show. Let me also introduce Fatima Agarkar. She is the founder of the Agarkar Center of Excellence. She's a veteran with three educational startups. Uh, Ace, in fact, interestingly, combines sports and education. Not just that, she is also an award-winning educator, an avid blogger, and a parenting expert. She's also going to be authoring a book on parenting. Uh, and finally, of course, uh, Dr. Mrs. Indu Shahani, currently the president and chairperson of ISDI or ISDI and ISMI. But uh, that's not all, of course. She is also the leading educationist who has in the past served as the former sheriff of Mumbai and has a rich experience and expertise of 25 years as the principal of one of Mumbai's foremost college, HR College of Commerce and Economics. So ladies, thank you so much for joining us today. And let me at the outset wish all of you a very happy Teacher's Day and extend my gratitude and appreciation to all of you for what you do in shaping uh, you know, young kids, students, and us as well as adults to what we are today. So um, again, let me again, uh, in the order of perhaps age group specialization, uh, start off with you, Shubdha, first. Um, a very interesting uh, program uh, is what you've developed at Brainology, self-learning program. I mean, you know, if you will ask this to parents of younger kids, uh, they'll probably tell you that, you know, I have to sit and get my kid as well to draw his or her attention to the computer when the teacher is teaching them online, which is obviously the case right now, right? Uh, and when you say something like self-learning, it seems to be quite a daunting task. So how does Brainology achieve that task? So, Mubina, you're completely right. Uh, you know, it's very difficult to have uh, find motivation in older kids. So, you know, under 10, it's a very, very daunting task to capture their attention, to keep them interested. The way we do it is 
we make it fun we make it relevant uh we gamify it so our app is completely it's like playing a game there is a fox talking and he's telling you a story he's asking you fun questions he's asking you to do fun things and you do small little things but those problems the things that you do there is a science there is a curriculum behind similarly even you know when you look at our books these are coloring exercises these are fun exercises things that children love to do but as a teacher and as a parent you know that what the child is doing is going to benefit them okay very interesting uh, fatima over to you then um sports and education uh, when i was in school it was you know uh, the two were usually put on the opposite ends of the spectrum you're either really really brainy uh, you know you're really good at your studies and you're you know into um, full fledgedly books and reading and you're a bookworm or then on the other end of the spectrum you take part in every heat competition you take part in every sports uh, uh, you know event that's there well i was definitely on the more bookish uh, side of the spectrum like no doubt about that um, but yeah it's a very interesting concept where you actually marry the two um, so how do you think you know sports and education can come together to shape a child's future to you know even shape the child's thinking um, uh, and you know enterprise skills as well Well, thank you, Mubina. I think the uh, the world of tomorrow. Um, if I can quote, uh, uh, you know, someone who's been an economist who said it, uh, Minok Shafiq. She said it very simply. Anything that can be repetitive will be automated. What cannot be repetitive is the skills. Sport cannot be. You cannot. Uh, I, I love to clone a tennis girl. I'd love to uh, clone uh, Virat Kohli, but we cannot simply because these are inherent uh, attributes. Um, the science behind that simply is that it can be nurtured uh, for for the longest time. I think our country, and I've done a lot of uh, research in this. Uh, we seem to be really rock bottom when it comes to competing with sports. uh we don't seem to um recognize talent not just from a technical point of view but also ancillary if you've done an mba you'll understand there's forward integration and backward integration uh it's not just the technical skill it's what is associated with sport so i think uh, performing arts sports um are going to be the industries of the future and that is part of the national education policy that's what they're telling us listen we we're going into the future we know we have to take this generation forward this is where it is um i love what uh, shobhadra said critical thinking uh sorry sport is about critical thinking it is that split second decision that you make which bowler will bowl the last over after that you crucify as a nation if you don't get it right right how do you what are your permutation combinations this has to be inculcated movina so sport as part of the national education policy uh, uh, you know i'm going to say i'm a sportsman's wife so it just comes naturally i'm not a sportsman i hated my sports days um but i understand the relevance of what it is what what's alarming mubina is the statistic that tells me we are next to america in the obesity level so it's not just technical it's now a health issue so so that whole sport integration might just be something that we need to think about for for the future Fatima when it comes to hating sports uh, well it's you and me both but the difference is that for me it's more out of no choice or the lack of capability of being good at sports 
Okay, and finally, Mrs. Shahani. Um, well, for uh, students who are my age or older than me, I guess, and of course, uh, live in Mumbai, Mrs. Indu Shahani does not need any introduction. And I'm proud to say that I as well have been an alumnus of HR College while she was the principal. So, uh, Mrs. Shahani, uh, again, I would like to take this opportunity to extend my gratitude, uh, you know, in contributing your little part in making me what I am today. But yes, uh, I remember that, you know, we had um, a series of specialized courses even launched in HR college. And that's what's happening in a lot of institutions now. You have these courses that are being developed that are very, very concentrated, very specific, and um, to a certain extent involve, you know, on the job training or vocational training as well. However, do you think that this entire shift to online education and you know, let me tell you, many institutions are actually planning for this to be a more permanent shift. Do you think such specialized courses can be taken or even delivered by teachers with the same amount of efficiency when you do it offline? So thank you very much, Mobina. And glad to see uh, one of my brightest students today is here in front of me. Let me tell you, we teachers get inspired by our students. And so I must thank on Teachers Day, I think we must thank our mm. students for inspiring us. So that's that's great. Yuma Mubina was one of the class toppers. She was not like my other students who are outstanding students who stood outside the college, but she was always inside the college. So um, Mubina, first of all, let me thank you for inviting me here. It's always been my dream to attend a kitty party, but I never could get time to attend any <laughs> kitty party in my life. And I think that you calling it a kitty party is fun <laughs> and you calling it a money and we are a part of i mean i was really wondering probably shubhada and fatima are into that uh, league that we're calling it a money making series uh, but you know, uh, education is a not-for-profit uh, uh, in the it, it's in the not-for-profit realm. But we are definitely creating the wealth of the nations. I think it's education that determines the GDP. So I, I'm I'm very proud and thank you so much for having me here. Yes, I think what you've said is very right. Um, I have to say, the day I became a principal of HR College, I received a note. And that note from was from a very, very, very important person. Porter, by the way, Porter Hamal wanted for a job of a Porter minimum qualification BCom. Now. I said to myself, am I going to be producing uh, porters in a BCom college? Where was the value and of a BA, BCom and BSc? Things that were started under the British rule and many, many years back. And so I started thinking and I thought the only thing else that we could do very quickly and you probably also benefited, uh, Movina, is when we introduced the chartered accountancy and our whole force went on that and i started creating more and more encouraging students to become chartered accountants but not everyone is a chartered accountant and i used to say that bcom i studied bcom i taught bcom and i was a principal leading the bcom college all through this the 19th century curriculum was being taught by 20th century uh, professors to the 21st century students. Time we needed to give a break. And so we introduced, I'm glad we pioneered the University of Mumbai's Bachelor of Management Studies. I was very much instrumental in using, uh, in introducing the BMM, the Bachelor of Mass Media, then B BAF, um, Accounting and Finance, Financial uh, uh, Management, and many such courses. But beyond the point, I think that's when I got the urge of starting something absolutely different. And that was, I knew one man had changed my life and that was Steve Jobs. How? Through this one iPhone, right? Now, what was it that was changing? Design. Design was changing the world. And that's when I wanted to, a commerce professor, 
a commerce principal starting a design school. And then, of course, we have the School of Design. The, now we have the School of Film, VFS, Management, and Entrepreneurship. I think that's something that we don't teach even at the undergraduate level. So having started all this, you're now talking about what happened on 16th March. 16th March, what happened? 16th March, education had to embrace technology. In a way, I would say a crisis sometimes brings in best results. And the best results brought out were, we had to do it. All this time, formal learning was supported by online learning. Today, online learning has become formal learning. And look how lovely it is. I would love to get a Shubhadas Fox into my class to wake up my students once in a while to, to tell them a story while my, my professors are talking. But I think the online learning is fantastic. Why? Because today we are able to see that from the chalk and talk, we have moved into login and talk. And the professors are more comfortable. Professors are bringing in different kinds of things and, and doing it. And you talked about uh, personal contact. I feel every student is in the front row because they are all in front of you. So I think, yes, uh, online teaching is becoming very, very popular. We've also done an academic audit, and I maybe tell you a little later about it. But I would like to say that I think the future is not just online, it will be hybrid. I think we'll have to work between the two. I mean, at this time of the year, parents would be calling up, Parel is flooded, it's raining, what do we do? Close the schools, do this. I think all this will go. The academic continuity will go. Colleges may be closed, schools may be closed, but learning will not stop. And that's what technology will do for us. Well, I used to always hope that my mom would call up school or college and say, you know, the rain, it's, it's raining and my daughter cannot come. But she unfortunately never did. So thanks a lot, mom. Uh, but uh, yeah, it, it's great to know that, you know, even though we do have a screen between, you know, the teacher and the students, it's the same quality education that will be transmitted. Yes, perhaps it will be limited only to the online mode for now. But, uh, you know, hopefully when we do open up and, and you know, uh, the health crisis is behind us, um, like Mr. Chani said, we may perhaps adopt a more hybrid model. Just one last, uh, you know, round of questions before then I open up the floor, uh, you know, to my three uh, guests. Uh, Shubhna, um, you know, if let's say today a prospective early educator or, you know, a teacher comes to you and she says, look, you know, I'm interested in teaching younger kids, you know, uh, under the age of 10, let's say, uh, how should I do that? Or, or even if a parent of, of, you know, a child who's under 10 comes to you and they are, tell you that, okay, you know, how should I sort of educate my child? Um, what would you say? How should it be different? And also I want to get in your take on life skills. Um, in India, we really don't give, uh, you know, that bit so much importance. Uh, do you think that is something that should be inculcated for, you know, kids that are under 10? Um, very important question, Mubina. So let me start backwards by say, when you say, should it be inculcated in kids under 10? 85% of our cognitive development is done by the age of 10. So therefore, this is the most crucial period of input. So yes, absolutely, we need a more wholesome uh, imparting of learning of life skills before the age of 10. That goes without saying. Coming to your second part of the question as to how a new teacher or a new parent should look at education or learning for their child. Let me put this in perspective. Most of our kids today will be in jobs or will be making an income out of a profession which does not exist today, right? So what are we going to train them for? What you need to train them for is an ability to think critically, to learn new things, right? To learn new skills. The, the space shifts so rapidly, you know, we find that if you are in an engineering college and you're learning a programming language in your first year, it may be obsolete by your fourth year, right? 
So learning is going to be a lifelong process. Therefore, what do you want to do with that young child? You need to teach them to be able to develop new skills on their own. In the past, learning was about knowing. It was about having information. Information is now readily available. There is no constraint on information. In fact, teachers used to be custodians of information. Now, a teacher or a parent is actually, their job is to help the child interpret that information, to make sense of that information. How do I apply a concept? How do I apply what I know to solve a problem? And this is not simple application of knowing one or two things. It, this is about what is called complex problem solving. So therefore, you need to be able to apply your knowledge across multiple disciplines to be able to solve a real life problem. And a teacher or a parent needs to look at their job in that light, that I must tell the child or help the child be able to process learn, interpret, apply on their own, to apply concepts to solve problems. That is what I think the job of a teacher or a parent today is. OK, okay excellent. Okay, uh, you know, speaking about uh, parents, Fatima, uh, like I, uh, you know, uh, did tell our viewers as well, uh, uh, where, you know, during your introduction, uh, you're a blogger, you're a parenting expert as well. So I want to get in your take on um, you know, what role do parents play, you know, as teachers in the lives of a child? Uh, you know, uh, I, I honestly, you know, do not uh, really uh, uh, sort of, um, you know, have the slightest clue of how to deal with children or tweens, as we call them. But uh, the one thing I know is that for me, my parents were my first teachers. And now their role has become all the more relevant as teachers because they are spending so much time at home. So, um, you know, before I let you ask your questions to Mr. Shani and, you know, Shibda, just uh, wanted to know how do you think moms should sort of uh, train their kids, teach their kids, sit with their kids, um, you know, during this pandemic, during this lockdown? Honestly, uh, <clears throat> Mubina, I'm going to be very, <clears throat> very, very candid and say they need to grow a mindset. Um, as parents, uh, we've been brought up with certain traditions. You know, that's how we did it. And therefore, that gives us success rate. Um, not necessarily. Uh, I think the world has evolved. I think we need to recognize that the child in question is an evolved child. The child is exposed. The child has awareness. The child has opportunities to learn. So our role is not going to be more instructional, more uh, mentoring. And uh, maybe, maybe, uh, Mubin, I'm just going to be very honest and say this, we may be caught out as parents. We don't know enough. So simple thing is when my uh, son asked me, why is, uh, how can, uh, uh, why uh, the United uh, uh, Press, uh, you know, States president, why can't he go beyond term two? I had no idea. Do you? Do you, Shobhadra? Do you, Dr. Shani? We don't. Because that was what George Washington created as a constitution. And that's what they followed. Uh, right to education, that was part of our policy as a nation. We don't have all the answers. Um, I think we have to recognize children today have access to information, and therefore they're going to ask a lot more questions that we don't have. So the role of the parent is, in my mind, to take a back seat, to, to, um, to read more with the children, to understand, but also partner the school. You know, Stanford has a brilliant statistic. It's 50-50 parenting. We forget that. We forget that. We, we outsource it to schools and believe that they're supposed to teach. No, you're supposed to contribute as parents as well. And I'm a mother of a 15-year-old and I take huge responsibility in him understanding what Indian politics is and world politics is. So that's the point of parenting. I think we, we, we're outsourcing it too much to assume that we're 
paying schools to do this, but I think we need to recognize that uh, we play a role. You know, that's a very good point. I mean, and many a times, uh, let's face it, you know, the younger the kids are, what I would also understand is maybe they would want to, I mean, they would look up to their parents, right? I mean, they look up to their parents as having the answers to everything. So um, it's not just outsourcing off, um, a, a, you know, whatever uh, knowledge acquisition that the child has to attain to school, but it also is a responsibility of the parents as well. I pity our parents, by the way, who did not have Google. Thank God for Google. So even if there are these curveballs, uh, questions that are thrown at us, we can at least uh, attempt to answer them with a quick Google search. No, no, uh, Mubina, thank God, Dr. Shani beautifully yeah, ahead, pointed Dr. out, thank God for technology. Today you have actually yeah. an ability to validate yeah. your information. Otherwise you were, uh, you know, dishing out theories that <laughs> yeah. would not validate you. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. You know what? Uh, I want to now open up the floor to the new education policy and, and I know uh, the national education policy, pardon me, and I know Fatima that you were very, um, uh, you know, keen to uh, talk about this as a topic. And in fact, you had a question as well for Mrs. Shahani, uh, you know, on that topic. So uh, go ahead, take the floor. <clears throat> Dr. Shahani, I know that, you know, the K-12 segment has always been under a bit of scrutiny because we seem to be putting out students that come to you. And I know at some point you guys think that, listen, you know, if you could have done this, it would have been easier. Your advice to us in the K-12 segment with the national education policy so that we can implement that as part of the SOP. So first of all, uh, Fatima, let me tell you that, uh, you know, I always thank all principals of k-12 schools in fact we are going to be acknowledging the leadership of the schools they are you know the principals and teachers really do a fantastic job i have to thank you because all of you send us wonderful kids i don't know what we do to them in in the in the undergraduate education space but i can tell you you all are doing a wonderful job don't worry about this however I think the new education policy is bringing about some dramatic changes. And I think these dramatic changes are going to be uh, more centered on they are changing the entire structure. They are changing the entire structure of the K-12. Uh, they are now making it a five plus three plus three plus four, which is the five is the foundation year. The three is the preparatory year the three others will be the middle school and then of course for the secondary school i really don't know what's going to happen to class 11 and 12 because today the new education policy says that from the age of three to the age of 18 you are going to be in school and in a way that's going to be little more uh, emphasized through the five years of the um, early education child care that they are going to be looking at. So that is great. I think that's very good. Uh, the second thing change is that they're going to bring about undergraduate education. And undergraduate education, as you knew, was very siloed. You in schools, and I'm sure Subhada will agree and Fatima, you will agree. At least you had sciences, you had liberal arts, you had sports, you had extracurricular activities. You did try to bring up very good holistic all-rounded students. What used to happen in the colleges, they had to get into streams, which were siloed. And education stopped being multidisciplinary. When we started the design school, we said we had to see that the design school takes an elective from a management school, takes an elective from a film school, takes an elective from a hospitality school, takes an elective from a communication school. We wanted to make it multidisciplinary, but the system wasn't allowing us. I'm happy to hear this four things that have been introduced now in the undergraduate education and that is you will have a holistic education just like you all did given schools but even at the undergraduate more than a three-year course they're going to make it a four-year course so therefore you can have more exits at entry levels uh, the next thing that they are going to do is make it more vocational make it more interdisciplinary and make it multidisciplinary too and of course give as much and this you'll be happy to hear 
Fatima, give importance to sports and give importance <laughs> to extracurricular activities. So I think the undergraduate, um, I've always felt in our education system, I have gone through the education system in India and I'm very proud. Right from schooling to undergraduate, to postgraduate, to a PhD. And I feel uh, we are all great products of uh, the, our education system. However, we could strengthen it and we could make it a better education system. And I feel now technology that has come in will help. One of the things that I did not answer, which Mumina had asked me is, how do you teach practical courses? How do you teach design on, on, on the screen? And I mean, look what these teachers have done. They've got a Miro board. They've got a studio from home. You can actually prototype in a product design school. You can in, in a product design class, you can prototype your product, your new idea. You can send it to the printer the Amazon, it, it will get printed and your 3D printing will be brought back to you and your and, and your prototype will be in front of you within 10 days of your designing it. Can you believe this? This is technology. So I would say uh, a lot of changes are going to come in. Let's hope that the devil lies in the detail. Let it be implemented. It's only a framework now. Let's hope the NEP is implemented. And I'm sure we are all stakeholders and we all care for it and we will make it happen. Okay, excellent. Um, all right, uh, well, Dr. Shahani, over to you then. I know you as well have a couple of questions for Fatima and Shubda. Uh, so go ahead. Uh, in fact, it's a very interesting line that you have uh, mentioned for Shubda about creativity. Would love to hear Shubda's views on that. Absolutely, but anyway, take the floor, absolutely. Dr. Shahani. And I know that, uh, you know, in the four C's that we talk about, we talk about critical thinking, creativity. we talk about creativity, communication, and compassion. I bring in com collaboration is important also, but compassion, because I think today, as you can understand, uh, we have to teach that to the students. It doesn't come naturally to them. So we have to do that. Teaching thinking and teaching compassion is both important. Subhada, Shubhada, one question, and then to you, Fatima, I'll ask both the questions together. Shubhada, to you, uh, I think what happens is that our young people, when you especially make them critical thinkers, and you, you know, I see so many students who come out with, uh, you know, I, I, when I meet students in that class 10 or class nine or class 12, a lot of them would say, uh, we want to become a bartender. I want to, you know, do something very different, and I want to become an entrepreneur. And I'm, but you know, that's because you, the schools, have given them that knowledge of critical thinking and saying the choices and creativity. But parents don't agree to that. <laughs> I know my own husband wanted my son to be an engineer because he had gone to an IIT. He must go to an IIT. Tell me, how do you bring in? some of this critical thinking, some of this creativity to the parent parents, because um, Fatima is wrong. She said 50-50. In my case, the whole 100% is put on to the schools and, uh, and to the colleges and said that take care of our kids. And, you know, they, they just give it to us and we have to do 100% parenting. So that that's a question for you, Shubhada. How do we get these new age, uh, you know, uh, creativity and skills. We never talked about skills, but I think most important is skills. Skills today will give you the jobs of the future, not just knowledge, not just education. So how do we, uh, you know, help parents to understand that children must, how do we do that? Okay. And uh, Fatima. Can you also, can you answer the question for me? How does a cricketer's son not become a cricketer? <laughs> uh, by, by uh, uh, the one, of, this is be one of the best thing is by not watching television. <laughs> <laughs> but let me tell you something. Uh, I don't think you're going to get away from that. So don't give up on that, please. Don't no, I give know up I'm going to uh, call you uh, separately because that's all I get asked. So. Okay, but I'm going to call you back. But I have to tell you, uh, even when I had the president of India at HR College in our 50th year celebration, 
I did not get the attendance that Sachin Tendulkar got oh. when he came to my college. <laughs> and there were students pouring out of pipes. They had climbed pipes to go have a glimpse at him. They were coming into the fifth floor from classrooms to see, see the man. So, <laughs> Fatima, you can't get away from that. <laughs> I think the president can get away from having <laughs> its child, not a president, but not Fatima. Okay, let's On go. On a lighter note, sorry, Shubhadra, please go ahead. <laughs> Actually, Dr. Shahani, I completely, uh, you know, agree with you. Uh, and I think the reason that why it happens is because parents are very invested, very emotionally involved in the success of their child. And what they visualize is future success. And that is why they do what they do. And I'll tell you how at Brainology we have tried to tackle that problem. We actively talk to parents, we actively converse with them, and we try to show them, demonstrate to them what it can do for the child. So for example, we do these learning sessions. These are live learning sessions called Ask Me Anything. We bring very eminent people from very different walks of life. Right. So, for example, we had uh, a banker by day who submitted the Mount Everest. Right. He came and he spoke about he spoke about the failure of not reaching the summit on his first attempt, making it in his second attempt. Right. We had one of the most prominent car designers from India come and speak, and he spoke about how he got into this profession when the profession of car designing did not exist. So what when, when you demonstrate to parents that the future demands, you know, you cannot set a profession for them because the profession may not exist. So the what you can train them is to be ready for whatever the world brings to them. And when you bring this live, when you demonstrate it, when you have people who talk about their experience, about doing what they do. Uh, we had, we've had professions from wildlife photographers. We have a marine biologist who's going to come up. Uh, when these people talk about what, how out of the box decisions they have taken, the kind of success they have made. So then it makes the parents think. It also redefines success. And I think that is, probably one of the ways that we can reach out to parents to you have to give them a glimpse of another side of the world that exists they have to right. come out of their other vision so fatima over to you and i wanted to ask you a question that you're doing a lot of innovation in uh, co-curricular extracurricular activities and sports and so on uh, i would like to know how do we reach out to make all this available to the bottom of the pyramid. <clears throat> In the way, uh, Dr. Shani, I don't think I can answer that question completely, but I will say that uh, I think the national education policy has brought a light to that. You know, uh, for the longest time we've uh, we've been debating about private education, government education, etc. The fact that now um we're talking about every child every child having opportunities with core subjects and with um uh, you know liberal arts performing arts sports as integratable subjects within the curriculum uh quite frankly carnegie mellon has statistics and all the western uh, researchers have told us the the future is not your traditional industries Anything that is repetitive will be automated, guys. So it is about skills. It is about differentiation. It's, it's about your ability. So it's about specialize. So the whole idea of, you know, this STEAM education, and I, I very, uh, I'm very concerned about it. It's very engineering, math. I'm not a, I'm not a math or science or a. Uh, um, or, or someone who understands mechanics. Yeah. I'm a humanities student. And that was mm -hmm. never mentioned in STEAM, uh, except that it got in as arts. So arts was supposed to be graphic. So it was STEAM. 
So I think. All right. I, 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 so 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 uh, hmm. bottom line is with the national education policy, we're talking about sports integration, arts, performing arts, creative arts as part right. of the <laughs> integrated curriculum, which basically means it'll be graded. Movina, that means uh, All people. Right. Okay. Will be, Yeah, yeah. Okay, you know, blurred lines, that's what we're looking at education and you know, lots of takeaways from this conversation, a hybrid of offline and online participation from parents, which should just not be outsourced off. And of course, the importance of developing critical thinking right from the early from an early age. Uh, so much to learn from this conversation. Wish we could have pulled it longer, but I'm afraid we're out of time. So, uh, Shubhda, uh, Fatima, Dr. Shahani, uh, my thanks to all of you for joining us today on The Money Show on this very special episode. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, well, uh, if you want to catch this episode, you can go on to ET Now's YouTube page, hit subscribe, and this episode will be up in just a couple of minutes from now, thanks to technology again. But for now, we'll take a very short break. But when we return, Adil Shetty of Bank Bazaar will join us and he will decode how exactly we should be spending our credit cards to make the most use of them in the upcoming festive season. Don't go anywhere. <laughs>